about it. Well, uh, today we're going to jump into part four of this series, It's Not You, It's Me. It's not you, it's me, because we believe the idea is really simple. Healthy relationships start with healthy people. I'm going to say it again. Healthy relationships start with what? Say it to your neighbor. Say healthy relationships start with what? And so in order for us to do that, we've been unpacking this idea of all types of relationships. We talked about friendships. We talked about the ability of emotions even before we got into the series and to manage them effectively. And so now we're going to jump into part four and, uh, and I'm excited to preach this. So I'm going to go ahead and give you my sermon title today because I'm so excited about the sermon title. I'm going to just jump right out there and give you the sermon title. Dating for Destiny. Dating for Destiny. Now, if you are married in this room, I promise you there'll still be some content for you in this sermon as well. It may be that you want to give some advice to somebody. I promise you, you want to take notes today. Or maybe, maybe you're recently married and you're saying, man, uh, we didn't get some of this. Some of the content that I'm going to share today uh, comes out of some of the premarital information that we share. And so maybe you didn't do premarital with us. That's absolutely okay. But you're going to hear some things that we share that we think are instrumental to building a healthy foundation in any eternal relationship. And so I want to jump really quickly to the book of Ruth. I'm going to read some scriptures for you. I'm going to teach today. I'm going to teach today. So take, my time, take your time with me. We're going, to, we're going to take our time in Ruth chapter 3, verse 1 through 9 first. Ruth chapter 3, and I'm going to be in the NIV. And it reads like this. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be provided for. Now, Boaz, whose women who have, you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight, he will be winnowing bar barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. I love this part. It says, wash. That's a good starting point if you're trying to date somebody. <laughs> so I'll make sure there's low line through. I don't want to make sure we'll miss no parts, okay? Wash. <laughs> says, put on perfume and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there. Watch this, until he is finished eating and drinking. And that was not Coca-Cola, but that was uh, some, some sangria. Yeah. Oh, y'all gonna sit real quiet like y'all know what sangria is. <laughs> Everybody got scared. It was like, oh, Lord. Text says, wait till he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Now, let me just unpack this really quick. In this day and time, the threshing floor was a place that people not only went to do work, but in the evening, they kind of party, right? It was like Shaco Bottom, all right? Y'all with me? And, uh, and so they hung out down there. And whenever you saw something in the Hebrew context where it said uncovering of feet, it had sexual implication. What it meant was, I am signaling to you that I am desiring you or that you can uh, be intimate with me. In other words, this gets good, OJ. He says, he says, he, his mother, mother in law says, uncover his feet let them know you ready and do whatever he tells you to do or he will tell you what to do verse 5 I will do whatever you say Ruth answered so she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do when Boaz had finished eating and drinking he was in good spirits he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile Ruth approached quietly uncovered his feet and lay down in the middle of the night something startled the man he turned and then there was a woman lying at his feet who are you he asked wait a minute she's already uncovered his feet he's already told her some stuff to do then he wakes up a little bit later when he sobered up and said wait a minute what did i do what if i was good when you read that thing well i'll tell you now okay text says text says just reading the scripture who are you? I am your servant, Ruth. She says, spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. In other words, she said, take me in, own me, uh, be, be, make me a part of your uh, relationship, relationship. So verse 14, skip down there, says, so she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. The walk of shame. Oh boy. And said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing, hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed a bundle on her. Then he went back to town. In other words, he said, we got to cover this up. Nobody can know 
that you were here. In the message translation, it says it like this. Verse 14 says it like this. Ruth slept at his feet until dawn, but she got up while it was still dark and wouldn't be recognized. Then Boaz said to himself, no one must know that Ruth came to the threshing floor. He said, bring me the shawl you're wearing, spread it out. Then she went back to town. Interestingly enough, I've grown up in church all my life believing Boaz would be a blessing. Like, like, that's what we preach, right? Like, you need to get a Boaz. Come on, anybody ever heard that before? I need a Boaz. When really, Boaz and Ruth's relationship was a cover-up. It was something they were not proud of. Here it is. Something they did in the dark that he didn't want to come to light. And all of it is the result, this is the key, to a family member who said, this is the way to find love. Good God Almighty. And so many times, if we be honest, the reason we do not date effectively is because we are borrowing bad advice. From people who told us, show him a superficial version of yourself. And let him fall in love with the version of you that is not the part he'll see in the light. Show her a version of yourself that is not the version of you that is outside of the spotlight. And let them fall in love with the projection that is not the real thing. And then when we come to our senses, let's hide from the reality of what is. But in all of my searching, I wonder, is there another model for moving into healthy relationships that we might see? And it's found in Jacob. And some of you may remember I preached on this some time ago, maybe two and a half years ago. in Genesis 29. 14 through 21. Last verse I'm going to read right now. Genesis 29, verse 14 through 21. Now, we just talked about Boaz and Ruth, right, which is often articulated as a blessing, but really it was a cover-up. It was a relationship that was the result of a meeting at the club. <laughs> I'm in the text today. I'm going to teach today. We're going to be in first gear for a little while, okay? Genesis 29, 14 through 21 says this, though. After Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month, Laban said to him, just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing, tell me what your wages should be. Watch it. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you for seven years. He said, look, all I want in return for my work is Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than some other man stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel but they seem like only a few days to him oh, because of his love for her then he said to Laban give me my wife my time is completed I said the Bible good that's what the text say I want to make love to her I'm going to preach today for Rod why is this he didn't say Give her to me, let me make love to her, and then I'll show you I deserve it. He said, let me work for her, show you I deserve it, and then I want to get y'all quiet in here today. He understood the order by which to pursue her, and I would like to argue today that Boaz is not as good a blessing as a Jacob. That some of us have been praying for Boaz, and what we need is somebody who's willing to show us they deserve us. Jacob is a better example. And he loved her so much that no matter what it took to prove his love for her, it didn't even feel like work. He said, it didn't even feel like seven years because my love for her was so great. Two relationships. Two courtships, two dating experiences, one seeking stability, the other one waiting on standards. Ruth got a stable man. Jacob or, or Rachel got a faithful one. 
And in the context of dating, courtship, engagement, if you want to date for destiny, we got some lessons we can learn. Let us pray really quick. Lord God, I thank you now for all that you will do and say through this word today. In Jesus' name, we declare clarity, conviction, and courage. Amen, amen, and amen. I want to preach today from this thought. I'm going to say it again. Dating for what? That's a song that some of y'all might remember. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so, we'll throw back. We're going to all sing it together today. Might as well. Intro play a little bit longer. You know, every now and then. You're looking for somebody in your life. And, uh... Hey, Miss Williams, I see you. What's up, girl? Okay. All together. Everybody sing it with me. Hey. I ain't will never find enough. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta put it like that. Oh, girl. And I will never... Yes, sir. Go to move. Try to stick you. Girl, you... Come on, y'all know the lyrics. Y'all never know about nothing but the chorus. You are the only one in my everything. One big choir, everybody say it. What we say? I pray for someone. Break the music. That's the problem. We're praying for the wrong thing. See, right there. I wanted to stop right there. I'm good. Appreciate it. I'm good. Come on up. It's right there. That was the line. We needed to get to. We praying. And Casey and JoJo is our guide on what we need. Oh, I caught y'all. Y'all was with me too. Y'all was with me. They was like, yes, Lord. This is church today. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about it. I want to ask you what Casey and JoJo said. What are you praying for when it comes to who you want to spend the rest of your life with? He said, I prayed for someone like you. And as I've just articulated in reading the text, I genuinely believe some of us have been praying for the wrong thing. And I believe whenever we try to create a relationship or to create something that is healthy, we live in a culture that prompts us to look for what Naomi told Ruth to be. It was Look good, put on perfume, be in your best clothes. But how many of us know clothes change? Oh boy. And money can change. But people are what you should be desiring to date. Not what they have, not what they look like. Because that stuff can fade, that stuff can go. But what does not change is character. And too many of us have been compromised by dating appearance and not attitude by dating their contributions but not their character and when you start to look at your life I believe with all of my heart that the Bible is very clear that when we really look at how to build a healthy relationship when we really look at the foundations that we should be considering I think we've grown up in this culture that tells us that love is something that we should be looking for not living out Say it again. Love is something that we're always looking for, not living out. Because the person who should fall in love with you should see some love in you and flowing through you that's worth being connected to. But here's the challenge. Here's the big idea for the day. Are you ready? Here's the big idea. Love is not a feeling to be pursued. It's a function to be expressed. Say it again. Love is not a feeling to be pursued. Problem is, we keep looking to feel like we in love. I don't want to feel like I'm in love. I didn't want to feel love. And for some of us who've been married long enough, we know it don't always feel lovely. Y'all quiet in here today. If you've ever dated somebody for a significant period of time, it don't always feel great. And if you are looking and pursuing a feeling, you will find yourself consistently frustrated Because love is not a feeling to be pursued. 
It is a function to be expressed. Love is the function of the Christian. When people look at us, even in our marriages, in our friendships, in our relationships, in our dating, in our engagement, they should say, man, y'all love hard. Man, you so kind. Man, how do you still have peace about that? Man, how do you still have joy? Man, how do you still walk beside them when they have nothing left to give you? It's because love is not something I was pursuing as a feeling. It was something I am called to express. And I'm looking for someone who can reciprocate the function of expressing love. But in a culture that tells us to pursue feelings over function, we will get frustrated because we are not receiving what we want when we want it. And that is not the way God calls us to love. And when we look at the condition of the heart, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 4, 23, guard your heart above all else. Why? Because out of it flows the what? Issues of life. I'm going to put some scriptures out there today. I need y'all to follow me. Proverbs 4, 23. So if my heart is the source of issues, that means I first need to evaluate the condition of my heart before I need to think about committing to somebody else. And there are three compartments of our heart that I think we need to take inventory of if we are going to be effective in dating. Okay, can we go to gear two? Here it is. We're going to move up a little bit, move up the pace. Desire of my heart is the first thing I need to look at. The desires of the heart. Psalms 37 and 4 says this. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's exciting, right? Here's what happens. Most of us skip to the second part, not the first part. The Lord will grant you the desires of your heart. Cool. But it starts with take delight in the Lord. Now, the word delight in the Hebrew means this, to be pliable, easily bent, or flexible. In other words, to delight in him means that when I enter into the presence of God, I'm not coming rigid about my expectations. I'm coming pliable, flexible, And saying, God, I'm in your presence, and as I delight in you, my desires are altered to more reflect what you desire for me. Can I take my time right here? This is why many of us date wrong. Because we are not delighting in the Lord, but we want the desires of our heart. So here's what happens. When you are not delighting, when you are not in the Hebrew word, when you are not flexible, when you're not pliable, when you are, cannot be moved and bent and malleable, and God can't mold you into not what you want, but what you need in a man, not what you want, but what you need in a woman. Watch this. Now, when we come to God outside of that nature, outside of that character, now God can say, this is the person I want you to connect with. You'll be like, I don't want that. Right? God said, this would be a great woman for you. Nah, bruh. Nah, bruh. Here's, here's how petty we are. We, we reject some of God's blessings for some of the pettiest of stuff. I can't rock with their shoe game. Y'all quiet. Act like y'all ain't never said it before. Act like you ain't never looked at nobody's shoes before and be like, I can't, we can't be fly together. What? What am I going to do with that? You better buy them some shoes and marry character and be happy with somebody who's going to be faithful. Y'all quiet in here today. You better save up and buy them the shoes you like. But we're not pliable. So we say, Lord, grant me the desires of my heart. He said, but would you delight in me first? Would you come into my presence? Would you come into prayer? Would you come into moments with me and say, hey, more than what I want, God, I want what you want for me? So before I ask you to to grant me the desires of my heart, let me align my desires with your destiny for me. This is why our life must start, we talked about a week or two ago, with prayer at the core of it and surrender. You remember two weeks ago, we talked about uh, the Bible and Job talks about, so I surrender to God daily and then I pray. What are we really saying? We're saying, God, my life starts with surrender. Because if I surrender to you, now my desires are in alignment with your destiny for me. So the first thing we have to evaluate is the desires of our heart. And again, in the scripture we read earlier, we see two different desires. Rachel's desire, her father's desire, is that she gets someone who deserves her attention. There is a standard and an expectation connected to their courtship. Ruth's desire is just to be taken care of. 
And that don't just apply to women. Because there's some men too looking for somebody who will take care of them. Because they desperately want to remain a boy when God is calling them to be a man. I'm preaching today. And you need to know which one you're talking to before you decide to say yes. So, so there is a desire that we must effectively evaluate because we don't want to end up in a relationship that is hidden and shameful. Instead, we should want something that is the result of standards, work ethic, and love that has been functionally expressed. Here's why. The desires of your heart dictate the health of your decisions. So when your desires are in appropriate alignment with God, your decisions will be healthier in relationships. Here's the second thing, though. We got to evaluate the disciplines of our heart. The disciplines of our heart. I want to bring your attention. There's something we preached about in the emotion series before this one. This is I want. And the reason I'm naming some of these things historically is because I want you to understand that we've been on a trajectory to get here. Before this series, we talked about emotions for three weeks. Why? Because that's the foundation of a healthy relationship. And so we talked about emotions. And one of the scriptures that we highlighted was Jeremiah 29 and 17. I'm not going to put it on the screen, but put it in your notes. And we talked about that the heart is deceitful above all things. Y'all remember that? So who can understand it? In other words, the heart requires discipline. Some of us can tell the truth and say, I've done, or I'm going to say how I feel it. I've done some dumb things because of a deceitful heart. I've made some poor decisions because I was emotionally invested into wrong people in wrong places. And so because the heart is deceitful above all things, Jeremiah 29 and 17, we must discipline our heart. No different than you must discipline your appetite. I gotta be honest with y'all, I feel pretty guilty standing up here today because I ate horrible all weekend long. I mean pizza every day. I just, I ain't even try to be, you know you just, just live in a lifestyle of gluttony when you just see it and eat it just because it's there. Y'all, y'all, I know y'all not gonna testify today. I'm preaching to myself. I've been stealing pizza from my kids. I've been... You know you're in a bad condition when you look at your kids be like, you want that? You want that? <laughs> Trying to convince my kids not to eat. I'm just, it's bad. It's been bad this weekend. And no different than your appetite must be disciplined and your body must be disciplined, so too must your heart be disciplined. Somebody might say, how do you discipline your heart? I'm glad you asked. I- I'm going to give you really quick. I'm going to move through these. I'm going to zoom through these, take a picture or something along those lines. Uh, but this is something we always share in premarital. It is a way to create a healthier, holistic relationship or a holistic intimacy because intimacy, here my heart here, is not just sex. It is the ability to curate closeness. And there are multiple expressions of closeness in every relationship. And the challenge for many of us is we only work to develop a few parts of closeness, not the forms of intimacy that span over our entire relationship. So there are 10 forms of intimacy. I'm going to walk through them really quick. I'm going to put them on the screen. And then I know I promised to do this last time. I'm going to do it this time. I'm going to do a video unpacking these a little bit more this week on Facebook Live or something of that sort, kind of unpacking these. Number one is communication intimacy, the ability to to effectively express feelings and needs. So some of us got to work on communication. Some of us, what drives us apart or away from closeness is we don't communicate effectively. Intellectual intimacy, the ability to be mentally stimulated by one another. Here's in, in other words what that means. It means there's some seasons where your body won't turn me on as much as your mind. Or let me say it another way. It's some seasons where I don't want you to kiss my neck as much as I want you to read a book with me. Oh, quiet. Okay, I'm going to move on. <laughs> just made five men mad. Okay, God is good. I'm just look down. Spiritual intimacy, the ability to share the same values and core beliefs. Can we read a scripture together every day on there? Not quiet. Can, can, we, can we watch a sermon? Can we, can we talk about our beliefs at the core of who we are? Conflict intimacy, the ability to identify and resolve challenges effectively. 
recreational intimacy, the ability to find mutual enjoyment and compatibility in time spent together. Some of us are great at some of the other things. We're great with our finances. We're great with our sex life. We're great with communicating. But the problem is we'll never do nothing fun together. Right? Domestic intimacy. This is, I don't, I'm going to skip past this one because I don't do good with this one. So, somebody said, don't skip that. <laughs> The ability to share the same values about the management and culture, I'm sorry, the ability to serve one another in tasks associated with domestic expectation. Some of us are divided in our homes right now because you just won't take out the trash. You just won't wash the dishes. You just won't make up the bed and put 12 pillows back up there. (laughs) Why are we putting 12 pillows back on the bed and we getting back in the bed tonight? Sorry. That was a personal vent. I apologize. Woo! Twelve. We putting them back on and we taking them back off. Talk about it later. <laughs> Can I get an amen right there? Anybody? Amen. Okay. Created three arguments on the way home right there. Lord have mercy. Financial intimacy. The ability to share the same values about the management and culture of financial stewardship. So one of the top three reasons people get divided or divorced is over money. Are we talking effectively about what our vision is for our resources? I'm almost at the end. Commitment intimacy. The ability to find a mutual understanding about the concept and boundaries of commitment. You know why some of us are frustrated? We never had the same understanding of what commitment was. I thought I could meet a coworker and go out and have some need after work. You like, excuse me? I thought, I, thought, I thought this was just, you know, I thought it was cool if I text so-and-so. Hey, uh, wait a minute, boy. Tell homeboy if he texts you again, I'm showing up. <laughs> what are we saying? We just never discussed. What is your idea of commitment? And is it aligned? Emotional intimacy, the ability to be vulnerable and authentic with someone without fear or doubt. Can I share my whole heart with you without shame or fear of judgment? Last one, sexual intimacy. This one is self-explanatory, I hope. The ability to share desires and expectations to pursue mutual satisfaction with one another. Here's what I'm trying to articulate to you today. Here it is. I want you to hear my heart. When dating for destiny, you cannot assume that two expressions of intimacy will sustain you for a lifetime. And the danger in our culture is we teach people, here it is, to enjoy sex with one another, to have fun with one another, and maybe go to church together. But then we won't talk about finances, we won't talk about commitment, we won't talk about being vulnerable. We only touch a few. And then wonder why our heart is in shambles because our heart never was disciplined. So in order for us to live out healthy, we gotta look at these three compartments. Here's the last one, the depth of the heart. Somebody say the depth. First Peter 4 and 8, First Peter 4 and 8 says this, most importantly of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. In other words, here it is, big idea. Here it is, big idea. Okay, I hope you get this. You can't create deep love with shallow people. Okay, Mike, I'm going to just talk to you real quick. You know why people get frustrated in a relationship? Because you keep trying to have deep conversations with somebody who has no depth. You keep wanting to swim, and they don't know how to, so they keep begging you to stay in the shallow end of the pool. And they say, let's just get our feet wet. And they'll be like, I can't marry somebody with my feet wet. I got to marry somebody who's all in. And so if you can't have the capacity to go all in, we need to move on. But you're trying to create deep love with shallow people. How do I prove it? Let's go back to Boaz. Boaz is attracted to her perfume, her clothes, because that's all she projects. That's shallow. Jacob is connected to the deep. He's like, I want your heart. I want your figure. But I also want your ideas. I want your attitude. But I also want to work with you on vision. I want all of you, and I want to create something that has depth to it. And so if we are to effectively date for destiny, we have to evaluate and take inventory first and foremost of the desires of our heart, the disciplines of our heart, and the depth of our heart. Now, I know some of you are saying, okay, Vernon, that sounds real good, but I'm leaving here today. Uh, 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 and, and, And why does all this matter? Here's why it matters. Because if you fail to focus on these foundations, you will find feelings, 
but you won't find fulfillment. And the struggle for so many of us is that we have found something that feels good, but it's a temporary experience because it's built on a faulty foundation. And eventually the future of this thing will be limited because it was not built on a strong foundation. When we got into it, our desires were all a whack. When we got into it, we had no discipline. When we got into it, we had no depth. But we wanted to last. So I'm going to use these last five minutes to be extremely practical. Can I be extremely practical? I want to give you five rules for dating for destiny. Five rules, real quick. Five rules that I think you can take. Please write these down. Uh, uh, if you're single, if you're dating, if you want to give somebody better advice on dating. Some of you have already looked at some of this and be like, man, okay, cool. Some of these are just going to be reiterations of what I've already stated. But five rules, I just think, kind of summarize, will be a healthy start to your dating life. Are you ready? Yeah. Y'all look quiet. Are you ready? Yeah. Here it is. Number one. Oh, boy. Clarify your intentions. This deals with integrity. You know, a great challenge in our culture today. Here it is. We don't ask each other to date. We say things like, hey, yo, uh, yo, yo, can we, uh, can we hang out sometime? What the devil is hang out? Are you interested in me or no? Like, <laughs> hang out? What do you mean? Like, like what? Like play tennis? Like what? Like, <laughs> what you want to do? Do you like me? <laughs> All right, watch this. Clarify your intentions. That also means, okay, let me just talk to my ladies for a second. That means you have to respond with clarity too. Whoa. He'd be like, hey, man, I'd like to take you out sometime. I mean, I don't really know. You like him. Just say, sure. They'd be like, I just don't know why he didn't call me back. Because when he asked you out, you didn't clarify your interest. Oh, quiet in here today. This also deals with integrity. Here's why. Because we have too many people dating without clarity about what the person's intentions are you for. Here, oh, this is going to be, <laughs> it's going to make somebody mad today. And real men are not afraid of clarifying their intentions. I just, uh-huh. Only boys get scared when they say, I want to be married one day. They be like, I just ain't trying to commit to that right now. I ain't saying we get married. I say, I want to take you out on a date because I want to be married. They are not afraid to communicate their intentions. And so if we are to be effective in dating for destiny, we all have to come to an integral space. Here's why. Because anybody who can, cannot, cannot communicate their intentions to you, you need to stop investing time with them. All right, let me move to the second one because I just made three people mad. I made a lot of people mad in this sermon. This is going to be good. Number two, don't apologize for standards. I just, I don't, you know, if I tell him the truth, he's going to run off. Let him run. Men do it too. You know, man, yeah, man, I just, you know, I don't want to tell her I'm really broke. I, let me tell you something. Some of these men, I, I've been talking to some fellas, and I hear, why, you, why did you go spend that? Well, you know, she just said that's the type of restaurant she liked. But you can't afford that restaurant. You know, I heard of taking her to Maggiano's when you got an a Olive Garden budget. Huh? Jeff over here talking about Maggiano's got deals. <laughs> you better catch them on a sale. <laughs> Do they do sales at restaurants? I mean, just, we live in a culture where we lack the confidence to just say, like, this is my standard. Like, you want my body, but you ain't even stimulated my mind yet. Like, this is my standard. Like, where, where you going to put in the work? Like, like this is my standard. Like, yeah, you cute, like, like, you a beautiful woman, but, like, I want more than your beauty. Like, what do you think about? Because my standard is not just something I can post and get likes on. I, 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 want my, I don't want my boys just to be like, yo, she bad. I want somebody who I can build a future with that people still like looking at. Standards. Number three. Okay. 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 
Here it is. Ask meaningful questions early and often. This is how you save yourself from wasting time. You know what a lot of people do? I'd be, I'd be amazed. I talk to somebody and be like, we didn't date it for three years. And I'd be like, cool. Like, what's their family like? Oh, I don't know yet. What y'all been doing? <laughs> you know, I, you know t- just tell me a little bit about, like, them. Like, how did they grow up? I don't know. We never talk about it. I, people, some people call that a red flag. <laughs> That's what we call it. Like, throw, the, throw the flag out. Throw the challenge flag out. What is happening here? You got a secret wife we don't know about? What's happening? <laughs> Y'all laughing because everybody has been here and we don't ask meaningful questions. What are we talking about? We done went to every movie that's come out the last month. Awesome. Built recreational intimacy. But what I also would like to know is where you are emotionally. I want to know what you're wrestling with. What are your insecurities? What are the things you struggle with? What are your fears? What are your aspirations? Ask the meaningful questions early and often. And you will save yourself from wasting time. For some of us, if we had the right conversations in the first six months, we would have never invested six years. Number four, develop well-rounded intimacy. This is about building closeness. Again, we live in a culture that tells us pursue body, pursue fun, pursue this, pursue that. But talk about finances and financial aspirations. Watch this. Talk about how you deal with conflict. Ask each other questions like, hey, how did your parents deal with conflict? Did they just go sleep in different rooms? Or did they talk it through? Have you ever seen an argument before? Have you ever seen a healthy argument before? Right? Because conflict intimacy and communication intimacy and intellectual intimacy, go to a museum. Go see an exhibit. I don't even understand art, but just go do something different. (laughs) All I'm saying is don't depend on two expressions of intimacy to sustain you in a healthy relationship. Why? Because if you're gonna date for destiny, you need well-rounded intimacy. Are y'all all right? Here's number five, last one. Fall in love with someone's future. I'm gonna clarify this in a minute. Fall in love with someone's future. Do they have a vision for their life that you see yourself in? Here's what's crazy. A lot of us, fall in love with people's present. But we never take the time to take and evaluate, do you have a future that I want to even be a part of? Right? Like, I want to fall in love with your future. I want to fall in love with the person you're becoming. So you get into a point in your relationship, look, I ain't saying you got to ask these questions on the first date. Let me help 20 of y'all, because some of y'all going to mess yourself up. You go... <laughs> You're going to go out on the first date and you're going to be like, okay, my pastor said. First of all, ask meaningful questions early and often. Might as well start today. <laughs> How many kids you want? <laughs> like, no, like, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying this. I'm saying, look, don't invest years into something that you should be able to assess if it is eternal in months. So so when you start to ask people questions, one of the things you should ask anybody you're dating is this. What's your future of your life look like? Because if you don't have a clear picture of that, I can't sign on. And that doesn't mean trials and tribulations won't come. And I am a living witness. It doesn't mean that God won't alter those plans to some degree. But what you're assessing is, do they even have a plan for their life? I I put this in the inscription. (laughs) Both a plan and evidence should be included. If they tell you, yeah, man, my, 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 my plan for my life is to be debt free. And they didn't buy every pair of shoes that came out in the last month. Let me tell you something. There is no evidence to suggest that they're living out that plan. 
you be like, you just spent $650 on shoes. So what you tell me your future looks like is not in alignment with the way you're living your life. What is the vision they have for their life? Adam and Eve in the garden. I'm closing with this. Never forget that before God gave Adam Eve, he gave Adam a vision. Adam is in the garden. I'm going to preach more explicitly about this in the weeks to come. But Adam is in the garden. Just a little teaser. And God gives him the assignment to cultivate the garden, to grow the garden, to, to make it well, to make it healthy. In other words, he said, here's the vision for your life. You are called to this, this garden. Make it well. Develop it. Watch it. And then, as a result of his faithfulness to vision, he said, no, it's not good for you to be alone. The problem is, some of us are allowing loneliness to make us want the significant other before we have a significant vision. So now, watch this. We get to Ephesians. I'm going to preach on this. I just I feel it in my heart to say it right now. So then we get to Ephesians, and the Bible talks about mutual submission. Not just submission from woman, wife to husband. Two types of submission, but it does talk about mutual submission. But I cannot submit, as my wife would say, I don't want to take credit. This is our, always her quote in premarital. I cannot submit where there is no mission. I am submitting to mission, submission. So before I submit, what's the mission? And so many of us, baby, you say it so much better than me. You should preach that one. You, I think next two weeks from now, you're going to preach that one. I got in so much trouble just now. Y'all have no idea. Whose couch can I sleep on? I just want to know. Here's what I just want to say, guys. Look, Boaz and Jacob, Rachel and Ruth, two relationships. One is designed for destiny. The other one is just a transactional interaction completely overshadowed by shame hidden elements. Why? Because if you fail to focus on the foundation, you will find feelings, but you will forfeit fulfillment. So today, my heart's desire for you is simply this. I want you to not just pursue feelings, But to actually function in the expression of love, and I promise you this, when you learn to love well, absent of a boo, absent of a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a fiance, a wife, a husband, just the function of love, God will honor you with a Jacob and not a Boaz. And so today, I want you to bow your heads with me for a few moments. And today's sermon is one I pray that many of you on many different levels. We had a little fun. We laughed a little bit. For some of you, you say, hey, man, I got married already. I've been married for 20 years. But that intimacy thing, and that really helped me out. Like, we need to talk about those 10 forms. And, and maybe the question you want to ask yourself in your marriage is, hey, where are we falling short on these forms of intimacy? Where, where are two or three areas we want to be better at? Some of you are dating, and you're saying, man, these five bullets are going to really help me out. Like, I got some things to think about we have some things to think about and some of you may just be like I am single I am happy but when I'm ready I got some tools to start me on the right track whatever your context know this today God will meet you even in the midst of your relationships because his desire for you is that you date for destiny not for likes not for affirmation not to solve insecurity, not for financial stability, but for destiny. So Lord God, I pray now that every person under the sound of my voice would find the courage to date for their future. And I pray now that they would find hope in the idea that there are Jacobs in the world, that there are Rachels in the world, and every man and woman in this room would say, I'm looking for a woman who 
doesn't just want to show me her figure but wants to show me her future or I'm looking for a man who wants to fight for my love and not just one who wants me to offer him a piece of me but wants all of me God in a culture that consistently asks us to compromise the health of our relationships we reconcile today that we'd rather want the desire that you have for us than our own now, no, God, there may be one in this room today who wants to give their life to you. Maybe their starting point to even a healthy relationship is making a conscious decision today to give their life to you. They say, I want to give my life to Christ. I want to make a decision to express a salvation moment, and I want to receive Jesus into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Nobody's going to ask you to say anything. Nobody's going to ask you to do anything. But if that's you in the room, I just want you to wave your hand in the air. Nobody's going to ask you to say anything. Nobody's going to ask you to do anything. You said, I just came to church today, and I feel so deeply in my heart that the Lord wants to have me as his own. Like he's pursuing my heart today. And that the greatest love in the world is not the love I'll find with others, but it's the love I'll find in Christ. If you today, just lift that hand in the air. Amen. We see you. We see you. We're going to say this prayer all together in support of your salvation. Everybody repeating after me. We say, Lord Jesus, I give you my heart. I give you my mind. I give you my spirit. From this day forward, I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, would you give God a big hand? God, a praise all over the room.